Hey guys, this is Fiona Apollo, and I do art commentary. And today I considered doing a video exclusively on the trash fire show that is Velma, but as I kept mocking up my script, it didn't really feel like I was saying anything that hadn't already been said a hundred times over by other YouTubers. The humor is lowbrow, it talks down to its audience, the characters have been distorted into. <laughs> well, you can hardly say that this is the mystery gang since the gang is supposed to be, you know, likable. But the thing is, that wasn't really the whole gist of what was bugging me about the whole situation around this show, and it didn't really help to satiate my growing feelings on what led to it becoming the kind of show that it is. But what kind of show is it? Well, it's an adult animated series, but what does that even mean nowadays? If you ask someone what adult animation entails in the modern day, they'll probably tell you that it involves a lot of toilet humour, innuendos, violence, and other stuff to that degree. And they're not wrong, that's a pretty big chunk of what you can expect from shows like Rick and Morty and Family Guy, but how did we get here? Why is that what we think of when we imagine something that an adult would watch? There are so many beautiful and emotionally moving shows like Primal, Bojack Horseman and Castlevania that break this mould. It's such a vexing irony considering the seemingly never-ending and incessantly annoying bias from people that animation is only for children. Oftentimes in my eyes it feels like adult animation is more immature and childish than cartoons intended for this perceived demographic. I have a slight theory going on in my head that this might be due to the fact that adult animation is in fact trying to cater to children, more specifically teens, in an attempt to pull in a more dedicated viewer base that thrives on shock value without having to actually admit that. It would certainly explain why some shows like South Park and Velma take place in schools. Whether this is true, I have no idea, it's just a game theory, but that's why we're going to do some research and see if we can find out. So today I'm going to discuss the history of adult cartoons, what they consist of in the present day, and where they might be headed in the future. Please note that while I do try to link all of my research, a lot of what I say in my videos is purely speculative and not based in fact, unless evidence is given to state otherwise. And if you like what you're hearing, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. What do you think of my little theory? Do you think I'm right? Am I overthinking things again? Most likely, but it's fun to talk about, so who cares? <laughs> Alright, let's get into it. Part 1. The Haze Code in order to understand adult animation, let's take a look into the history of animation as a whole. We also need to understand that cartoons and animation being a children's medium is also a fairly recent speculation, and that the events leading up to its current state were more so a byproduct of multiple instances within the film industry at large. And to figure out why this came about, we need to take a look at the Hayes Code. The Motion Picture Production Code, or Hayes Code for short, was a set of industry guidelines for the self-censorship of content that was applied to most motion pictures released by major studios in the United States from 1934 to 1968. The code was dubbed after the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, William Hayes. The reason this code was brought into effect was because Hollywood and the film industry at the time were racked with scandals that were being widely condemned by more and more organizations, as well as the general public. There were allegations of gross misconduct, SA, and so many other heinous things going on, to the point where around 37 separate states imposed hundreds of their own decency laws before the code came into to effect. And while we may now see things like moral corruption as just kind of the norm with Hollywood and being pretty impossible to contain, back then the industry wasn't anywhere near the giant that it is today, so these kinds of scandals were really starting to hammer away at its reputation. So lawmakers and executives sought to nip this in the bud as best they could. Coming around to animation specifically, when cartoons were first becoming popularised in the 1920s, they were primarily viewed by adult moviegoers and were shown to these audiences as short, silly clips as a way to get people settled before the main live action film. You'll notice that this tradition never really went away. I think we all know of at least one Disney or Pixar short that we saw when we were going to the cinema in our childhoods. But when it came to these shorts in the 1920s, there wasn't really a fully set out standard for what could or couldn't be shown on screen yet. And this resulted in all manner of dark, inappropriate and frankly shock value cartoons to be made, which included the use of drinking, which was illegal in America at this time by the way, heavy drug use, and a lot of not so subtle sexual references. This was also enforced by the fact that family movies weren't really the norm yet, so these cartoons could be showcased to adult audiences even during a time that was considered much more outwardly prude by today's standards, because children didn't have such easy access to them as much as they do today. I believe that in the beginning, because these cartoons were a relatively new thing and also didn't focus on real people, people struggled to find the line between what should and shouldn't be acceptable because the art styles, plots, and actions of the characters were just so wacky that people weren't really able to suspend belief enough 
enough to apply it to the actions of real people. And this debate is still pretty alive and strong in many ways today with things like anime, even if the discussion around it may have morphed considerably. It was only in 1937 with the release of Disney's Snow White did people start to view cartoon characters as having the potential to depict more realistic persons. And it wasn't until 1930 to 1934 where these cartoons were gaining a reputation for being particularly raunchy, in addition to Hollywood's multitude of scandals, that the Hays Code was finally brought into effect. The Hays Code, when it was first introduced, was taken extremely seriously, and it pretty much put a stop to everything that encapsulated cartoons of the era before it was brought in, which is now referred to as the pre-code era. Though again, just bear in mind that this is only related to large industries within Hollywood, such as Warner Brothers at the time. Things like indie animation or animation not produced in the United States could still get away with a few things, up to a certain point. American filmmakers did also find ways around the code via subtext. For example, intercourse was obviously a no-go, but to illustrate that the act took place, you would often see a female character reapplying her makeup and a male character smoking a cigarette. That said, the Hays Code did ban many things from being explicitly depicted, including profanity, insulting Christianity, and any licentious or suggestive nudity, even in the form of silhouettes. It was a time when things truly began to be restricted visually, but by that same token, the Hays Code era is when people started to create films that were much more emotionally intelligent and had the beginnings of a consistent narrative. This is when flagship characters and shows such as Mickey Mouse, Looney Tunes, and Tom and Jerry hit their stride and became so popular as to stand the test of time. These cartoons, in addition to the release of Snow White, is where the idea that animation could be for both children and adults first became recognised, and it began to be used more and more as a way to encourage certain behaviours and choices for all ages. This was especially the case during the 1940s when Disney's propaganda cartoons encouraged families to contribute to the war effort during World War II. Though even with this becoming more of an accepted idea, it was still widely viewed that cartoons were skewed towards adult audiences due to the sheer amount of unsuitable contents within them that people believed weren't good for children. And then came the 1950s, when various antitrust laws came into effect, which more or less ended up slashing budgets for film and animation, with animation being one of the department's worst hit by this. Because of these laws, cartoons became far too expensive to produce in the same way they had been previously, and so they adapted into what we now know as limited animation, which is where animation frames were looped and recycled constantly, and character poses were now held for longer periods of time on screen, and only certain parts of a character would be moving in a given shot. For example, only a character's mouth would be moving during a dialogue scene. You can even see this being done in Disney films of the time, the most prominent example being Robin Hood's Maid Marian dance being reused in the film The Aristocats. And for the most part, this was adopted for children's animation more so because it was a safer bet that guaranteed the shows wouldn't be cancelled. The rise of children's centred media was also aided by the rise in mass-produced television sets that could now be found in everyday households, which coincidentally also gave rise to the Saturday morning children's cartoon formula. So this is definitely something that we still see today. A lot of young children's animation is very quote-unquote low effort and utilises a variety of time-saving techniques. We see this today in shows like Peppa Pig and Dora the Explorer, especially, where puppet animation is used to save on frame drawing in order to make use of the limited time given to complete episodes. It also helps that young children are generally less picky when it comes to the content they consume, or rather, the correct phrasing is probably they don't really get a say in it and will just watch whatever their parents leave them with. The enforcement of these laws in the 50s is generally where this trend of deliberately only catering to children began, though there were some cartoons such as the Flintstones that attempted to break this mould by adopting a sitcom style method of storytelling that appealed to all ages and even went as far as to depict Fred and Wilma in bed together, and even showed Wilma pregnant, which were things that had been pretty much outlawed during the Hays Code's reign. But by this point, people were starting to ignore the code until it largely just stopped being enforced. Though, sadly, the Flintstones declined in popularity in its final years, and many referred to this as the death of adult-oriented animation. And for a substantial amount of time after, this was indeed the case, and its Saturday morning kids' cartoons pretty much dominated the medium. So that's where we're going to cap off our little history lesson for a moment, but what we can see from this is that while adult animation in modern day might seem very wacky and out there and ridiculous, this pretty much lines it up with what it was like during its formative years in the 1920s. So in a sense, all we've really done is come full circle. But in that same vein, let's also not forget that the biggest demographic of people today who claim that animation is for children were the exact group that grew up in the 1950s onwards with Saturday morning cartoons as the only real representation of animation that they had consistent access to. So of course they're going to think that, because it's all they've ever known. And to them, it's
it's the act of making cartoons for more adult audiences which is the new invention. Life really is just swings and roundabouts, isn't it? The other big issue with this though is that these same adults who think this now take up the majority of film and TV executive positions who get the final say on what shows get greenlit, and many of them still also refer heavily to certain rules outlined in the Hayes Code. Anyway, let's pick things back up with how adult animation experienced a revival both before and after streaming services came about, starting with the 1980s. Part 2, MTV and the rise of streaming. So it looked like the adult era of animation had been lost after the Flintstones reached its end in 1966, and Saturday morning cartoons came out on top, causing a cultural shift in the perception of animation and its place in the world of entertainment. And while we did get many great shows even during this era like Scooby-Doo, this perception of a strictly children's medium has persisted in people's minds who grew up during this time which is now commonly referred to as the animation dark ages. But then in 1981, something happened. The music television channel, more commonly known as MTV, came about and allowed adult animation to get its foot in the door again after all this time. The channel's creative director director Fred Zebert equated the medium as being the closest visual representation to rock and roll, and had a pretty clear vision for how he wanted it to be incorporated. This ended up making big waves for both the adults who grew up on TV shows like Looney Tunes that the channel took inspiration from, as well as with the younger generation who enjoyed the music videos shown on MTV itself that also utilised animation in bold and refreshing ways. This is when we started to see music videos like Take On Me effectively become pop culture cornerstones of the medium. Following this renewed and positive intrigue towards animation, in 1989, The Simpsons aired on television, and oh boy, <laughs> this show had a massive hand in invigorating people's interest in the medium thanks to a focus on pop culture references, combined with the sitcom tropes not seen since the Flintstones, and became a true mainstay. While this sounds like a very tired trope nowadays, this had only really been attempted by the Flintstones at this point, so it was pretty new and exciting at the time. The Simpsons actually came as a big shock to audiences due to its frequent storylines surrounding very mature and nuanced topics such as infidelity, loss, religion, sexuality, and many others that people hadn't really been exposed to in such an open and honest way before, never mind in animation. It became massive, and the gargantuan success of The Simpsons showed people that this style of animation was something that viewers were receptive to and could be potentially replicated. So it was. Various shows that had a similar art direction and narrative formula began to follow in The Simpsons' footsteps later on in the 2000s, the most prominent examples being shows like Futurama, Family Guy, and American Dad, all of which, even despite the clear reference point, managed to differentiate themselves enough to come into their own. There were, of course, other sources that were also pushing adult animation at the time, such as MTV's various breakout shows like Beavis and Butthead and Daria, as well as shows from other networks like Nickelodeon's Ren and Stimpy. But the thing is with these shows is that they didn't quite have the same level of influence and staying power that The Simpsons had, so it's still regarded as the largest contributor to the current state of adult animation by many. In my opinion though, the true narrative blueprint came in 1997 when South Park was released on Comedy Central, and went to even more extreme heights with its dark humour and satire, paving the way for shows like Family Guy to flourish after audiences had become more comfortable, maybe desensitised is the better word, with more neurotic characters and shocking plot lines. And ever since then, this formula of adult cartoons having similar art styles and instances of shock value content just kind of continued well into the current day, and I feel like this was proven with the conception of Adult Swim. Before it became its own channel, it had its beginnings with the Channel Cartoon Network, and shows that would go on to define Adult Swim earned only on Cartoon Network's After Hours block when the channel's primary audience of school-aged children went to sleep. In the very beginning, this was a huge gamble that was bleeding money for a time, but it saw success through the show Space Ghost. After this, a few more spin-off shows of Space Ghost were created, and in 2001, these shows went on to be aired on Cartoon Network's After Hours programming block, now known as Adult Swim. Adult Swim pushed a lot of boundaries with what type of content it was willing to show, and spawned the creation of various series such as Robot Chicken, and its most famous creation, Rick and Morty. It also helped revive various soon-to-be-cancelled shows by agreeing to air episodes that other channels just wouldn't such as Family Guy and Futurama, and even introduced many viewers to adult-oriented anime shows such as Cowboy Bebop and The Boondocks. After this, in 2007, streaming services really started to take off and we started to see a drastic shift in how people viewed their shows. As less and less people were watching regular television in favour of Netflix, HBO and other services, these streaming giants eventually began to create their own original shows. Netflix especially seemed to lean into the direction of adult-oriented animation and produced many a show in-house from Bojack Horseman to Castlevania to Inside Job. At the height of all of these shows being released or in production, many people believe that due to the shift in viewing habits, 
markets and the streaming services' willingness to greenlight such shows, this meant that adult animation, and animation in general, was really starting to bear the fruits of its labours in the strive to be respected on the same grounds as other mediums. But that didn't really end up happening. Instead, Netflix became infamous for cancelling shows after one or two seasons if they did not bring in an impossibly high or consistent viewership, viewer retention, or viewer demand. And while this happened with all shows, animated or not, when times became rough financially, the animation division was the first to go given that animation is expensive to produce, despite the massive amount of outrage and protest that came with this decision. But I digress. Even with that in mind, Netflix did have a hand in allowing shows that broke the adult animation mould to be created and to resonate with audiences, despite the streaming giant's other shortcomings in how it handled these shows as time went on. Am I salty about it? Absolutely. Can I change the past? Sadly, no, not yet. What's done is done, but that doesn't mean people can't be upset about it. So that's where our history lesson ends, and I guess this begs the question, can we definitively pin down where the current perception of adult animation came from? Looking at everything we've just gone over, I'm fairly confident in my assumptions that South Park and Family Guy are the main culprits in how we view both the aesthetics and subject matter of animation currently. What also ended up adding insult to injury when Netflix especially started cancelling shows was that there was a very clear shift where streaming services became very risk averse and would only greenlight further seasons of shows that did not push boundaries and followed a formula that had been proven to make a profit. This became obvious with shows like Big Mouth, which is still ongoing with six seasons and counting. And this is a problem because it's a medium historically built on a willingness to experiment and try new things. And streaming services' decision to put a stop on this and only pursue works that follow a tried and tested formula has left people feeling like adult animation has severely stagnated. It's a shame really, because when you look at this timeline, animation really has been through some major ups and downs, and this hasn't been the first time that the medium has been perceived of consisting of too much of one thing. With that said, perceptions and opinions are always changing, so let's finally take a look at how people view the genre today and deconstruct what led to these views being shaped. Part 3. What have they become? So, like with many of my videos, I put out a few posts asking people what reputation they thought adult cartoons had and why they think this is the case. It was a pretty overwhelming opinion that people thought adult cartoons contained a lot of edgy humour, shock value, and were cramming in tons of inappropriate themes that were only really adult in name, without any of the nuanced discussion or depth that shows like The Simpsons or Bojack embodied, leading them to be this kind of caricature of what an adult show should be. People didn't seem especially taken by the art style that's become synonymous with many of these shows shows either, a decent number of people described them as ugly, and quite a few equated all of this to adult cartoons feeling like an edgy teenager's interpretation of what adult cartoons should be. They're edgy and shocking for the sake of being edgy and shocking, and I genuinely think it's because the writers on animated adult shows hate animation and think it's for babies, and are trying too hard to subvert that expectation instead of actually making a good story. When the writers actually respect animation as a medium, you get gems like Arcane and Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Most of them just feel lazy in terms of writing and coat it all with a lot of edgy humour, innuendos, etc. Like, about half of adult animated shows from the past decade or so are literally just copies of Family Guy, and even that show is kinda overrated. Every show is a clone of whatever show is the main popular one. Heck, even I thought that Inside Job, which is one of my favourite shows, was just a Rick and Morty clone when it first came out, before I actually looked into it at all. I think that one period of time where everything was trying to be the new Family Guy has kinda put a hole in the side of the proverbial boat for a lot of folks. I just hope that whatever new stuff comes out next can repair that boat hole. I'm gonna link all of my posts in the description so that you can read the answers for yourself, there are some pretty good ones. There were a lot this time around as well, but overall, the opinion was pretty low. People don't seem to like these kinds of cartoons. But why? To kick this off, as we said in an earlier section, not much has actually changed content-wise from when animation was first gaining notoriety in the 1920s. Things just kinda came back around to being acceptable again after a long period of heavy censorship, but what has changed seems to be people's attitudes. I'm not going to say that people were more accepting of this stuff back in the 20s because that might not necessarily be true, otherwise why would the Hays Code have been introduced in the first place? And to think that would also have to imply that a lot of the stuff being shown in the 1920s cartoons was okay to begin with, and a lot of it just wasn't. There is not a cat in hell's chance that Betty Boop could be made today without being unrecognisable. I think it's a similar situation as when the internet first came about. In the beginning, there was no regulation whatsoever and people could just do and say whatever they wanted with this newfound freedom. I guess with that in mind, just saying attitudes and leaving it at that is a bit too vague. It's probably more so the freedom to express those attitudes that was lacking. But obviously, as time went on, things started to get out of hand and now, even with certain terms and conditions in place online, we still have a ridiculous amount 
of threats, harassment, bullying, and so much more going on with online communities. And it's a similar thing with adult animated shows. I definitely think that some of them are continually trying to push the boundaries and see just how much they can get away with not for the betterment of the shows, but because they know that outrage marketing can bring in just as much attention to your show as opposed to the show being actually good. But either way, there are a few reasons I'd like to go into as to why I think it feels like every proclaimed adult show is just a clone of Family Guy or Rick and Morty right now. The first, and in my opinion the most important, is that despite people's efforts, animation is still being seen as a genre instead of a medium, even by the people who are fans of it. And if you look at the majority of cartoon series that emulate the raunchy, inappropriate, bombastic series that came before, have you ever stopped to consider what genre specifically they all fall into outside of being animated? And while yes, a lot of them have their own genres like sci-fi, drama, and the like, for the most part we'll focus on sitcoms since that's what the majority of them are, but that's why they all look and behave the same way, because what you're actually looking at is a genre within a medium. It's not adult animation that you don't like, it's animated sitcoms. And there's also a reason these shows are getting multiple seasons compared to other shows, it's because that's just one of the staples of the sitcom genre. It's fast, easy content, and it can be done incredibly fast. Friends had 10 seasons, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, 15 seasons, The Big Bang Theory, 12, Will and Grace, 11. This also explains the art style to a degree as well. How else do you think they're getting all these seasons out so quickly if not by cutting out all the details and shading that would take up precious time? When it comes to actual character designs though, uh, yeah, I don't know. I wish they were less ugly too. What I think a lot of people don't realise with sitcom style shows in particular, live action or animated, is that the vast majority of the population treat them like TV wallpaper. Most people don't really watch what's going on to get invested in the plot or anything, it's just used mostly as background noise that you can occasionally laugh at the absurdity of. And that's also why they tend to be standalone episodes as well, with less focus being put on an overarching plot, so that people can just throw on any old episode on screen without being lost. This also tends to be why the ratings for them are so high and why they continually get multiple seasons, it's just easy viewing and that's all there is to it. Of course, that may not always be the case and some people genuinely do enjoy them, but that's what I think at least. The second reason for why there are so many is the illusion of saturation. We literally have any show we want available at the click of a button now as opposed to past generations who either had to wait until an episode aired on TV or even had to make a day trip out of it to go to the movies. When you have that much choice in front of you, it becomes easy to see how much of something is available. And this is why many people believe that there are so many of the same cookie cutter type of art style and narrative, because a lot of the time if you watch something on a streaming service, the algorithm will pick up on that and try to show you more of that same thing. Let's be candid here, almost everyone has watched a couple of episodes of Rick and Morty, so don't act surprised when Netflix starts recommending you Final Space and Paradise PD. Thirdly, we have the assumption that the people who work on these shows don't particularly care for them. And guess what? You're actually not that far off, because if there's any kind of genre you want to start out in when it comes to animation, getting a job with a show that has a bunch of seasons guaranteed and has a simplified, streamlined process is probably the best you can get. And the fact that people try to spin this as a bad thing just because they don't see the value in that particular show don't really seem to grasp that animation is just like any other job. You don't just rock it into making shows like The Owl House, you work on stuff like this where your job security is likely a bit more secure, and then move on to other shows where you can stand to put a bit more passion into it. It's only the same as climbing the corporate ladder. It's all well and nice to think that every animator is passionate about all projects they work on, but at the end of the day, it's just a job. And some people just want to go to work, do what's expected of them, earn their paycheck and go home. There shouldn't be any shame, and especially not any ridicule in that. And finally, let's come back around to mine and other people's theories of these shows being targeted towards teens instead of adults. So for this one, I'd like to pose a question to everyone. At what age exactly did you first get exposed to shows like South Park and Family Guy? And once you had that exposure, did you keep going back to it from time to time purely because it was everything you were warned against by your parents, only to watch it and think, what are they so worried about? Here's a short story time from when I did my animation degree. We were given an assignment one time to create a story pitch to present to a couple of people representing the BBC. When my group came to present ours, we were told that our pitch felt like it would only appeal to a very young demographic, and that the BBC had run some statistics on what precisely children were watching and found that children as young as eight years old were ready regularly watching Rick and Morty, and this was back in 2016-17, so you can only imagine what those statistics look like today. The fact of the matter is, if children have access to something, they're gonna seek it out and they're gonna look at it, because that's what children do. But what this can end up feeding into is that studios and companies will pick up on this, so the cycle just kinda keeps going with them catering to this demographic, knowing that it brings in consistent viewership, even if it's not the exact viewership they were intending. I'm definitely one of those people who think there should be a bit more regulation to make sure that kids don't stumble across things they 
they shouldn't. But the thing is, with stuff like streaming accounts and TikTok and things like that, it truly is only a matter of time because gaining access to these things is so easy. And after a certain point, responsibility has to fall to parents and guardians to determine when is a good time to expose their children to certain things. But you know, in my humble opinion, eight years old is obviously way too young to be watching Rick and Morty. Please check in with what your kids are watching every once in a while for God's sake. But yeah, overall, while I can respect the reasons why people don't like these particular shows, I believe that there is quite a bad case of misconception going on. What many view to be an overwhelming saturation of certain archetypes in adult cartoons are actually just a genre within the medium that gets largely misrepresented as being the face of it, not only by people from the outside looking in, but by its own viewer base too. And by that extension, a lot of people seem to believe that these issues have only recently started developing when, in fact, cartoons have been very adult and inappropriate in nature from the very beginning. As we said, at the start, there are many good adult animated series that don't fall into this genre or these tropes. Castlevania is probably one of my favourite adult animated series of all time and is able to stand out as a series with a gorgeous art style, compelling characters, and an engaging narrative. Yes, it contains gore and sexual themes, because it's Castlevania, but that's part of the course, and I guess they had to test it out for themselves before coming to terms with the fact that some parts of it just didn't work. Arcane broke records and had thousands of viewers in a chokehold over how spectacular it was. It was very clear that the series was made with passion and love put into every frame, and when season 2 drops, the hype is only going to pick up again. And then of course, you still have great shows even within the sitcom genre like Bojack Horseman and Tuca and Bertie. Oh my god, Tuca and Bertie deserved so much better, man, but sometimes shit happens and that's just how it is. Anyway, that's all from me. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe. Is there anything I missed out or that you wished I'd mentioned? Please leave your thoughts below, and I will see you soon. Stay safe, everyone. Bye!